deep in the winter wood, where the cold sky is almost as white as the snow-covered land, one may find through the forest lost back roads that stand out against the green of the woodlands like a bright white vein, though in summer they may be little more than half-grass-covered traces against the landscape as seen from the air. But even in the cold depths of deepest winter, stark and white, if one follows these little lost back roads deep into the forest, going slow, on foot, and watches carefully, turning the eye from the glowing sky and the glaring ice, one will inevitably discover, in those places where air, earth, and water are yet pure, a hidden, even secretive landscape, surprising with its dazzling colors, that shimmer red and gold and silver among the stark lights and shadows of the winter wood, in a manner so undeniably magical that it dares the boundary between science and the enchanted. And everywhere, everywhere, snow and ice and a thousand thousand forms arises like mysteries out of the forest shadows, to sparkle like mounds of coruscating gems. The little creatures of the wood that so often are seen yet overlooked, the whiskey jacks and blue jays, and myriad finches and nuthatches, and the tiny mammals that live in the subnivian world beneath the snow, are well familiar with this landscape, and depend on it, for theirs is a world of land corals, which most of us know as lichens. A small trek off those little lost, hidden ways quickly reveals various things, not quite secretive, just overlooked by the eyes of modern humans, who are, due to the urban lives of most, unaccustomed to seeing the still, small mysteries of nature. But if they should learn to look, and truly see, they would find before them evidence of the small lives of animals. A feather lying in the snow, the wide expanse of tracks of a snowshoe hare fleeing from an owl, a raven crying out that he has found food against a sleek gray sky, and if one dares go far enough, hidden half-iced over rivers, in hollows and vales, ideal places to find the land corals. Though we are deep in the heart of winter, yesterday warm winds blew in from the south, bringing rain and flattening the deep snow. And with this moisture and touch of warmth, lichens that had gone dormant with the cold suddenly came back to life, filling out and transforming into their full colors. Other lichens, such as this small fruticose lichen, about 10 centimeters in diameter, manage to keep their shape even if they grow on a tree in the parched open and their dry, papery condition perhaps enhances their lovely color, ivory white and olive. But if we continue to take advantage of the conditions of this rare and beautiful day, with its fluctuating cloud cover and blue sky, its winter rains and wet snows, and especially the flattened, easy-to-hike snow, and push deeper into the forest, we will discover a winter landscape filled with color, oft hidden from the casual eye. And here in this grove of ancient maples, sheltered by a steep-walled valley, we find growing upon the trees Hypogymnia and Cravoides. It lays itself out over the bark and labyrinthine paths. Imagine this landscape from the perspective of an ant that might live upon such a tree. The world it knows from its perspective is as different to us as would be an alien planet, and its journeys take it across a landscape comprised of the craggy dark crevasses of bark and shimmering pale living hills of lichen. In this landscape of hidden colors, we find last autumn's leaves encased in crystalline ice and pileated woodpeckers watchful of the next storm, while they search for insects among high tree branches covered in juvenile growths of usnea lichens. Just off the beaten path I find a great hemlock tree, where the gem-white brightness of a growth of crustose lichen catches the eye, but later transposition of this image to false color reveals not one lichen, but an ecology of lichens living side by side on the bark, and a bear patch a dozen meters away, now free of snow, reveals a mass of pale green crustos lichen, but here too, a hidden ecology is once again revealed by transpositions of false color. And the hidden ecology begs such questions as, what is different here, the fungal structure of the lichens, or their algal or bacterial partners? And if this represents different species of lichens, do they compete or do they cooperate? Alas, a quick walk through the forest simply to observe the land corals raises more questions than are answered. As I come around a sloping hill into the shadow of its north side where temperatures are always cooler, I find a magical sight. A wild apple tree covered in usnea lichens, and like the maple leaf I saw earlier, locked in ice as if set in crystal, 
the ice arenas frozen upon these little usnea lichens and left them sparkling like gems. More sheltered spruce tree nearby boasts a lush growth of usnea largely protected from the icy rains, and on the top side of its bark, more of the labyrinthine bone lichens we saw earlier. I suspect this type of lichen makes a great place to tuck seeds into, or perhaps look for insects in the spot of warmer weather, as a chickadee is busily rooting among it, barely a meter overhead. Few persons know that even in the far north, when winter lays a layer of snow over the ground, the small things that live directly upon the earth do not cease their activities, and in this bare patch of a few square meters, we find ferns, moss, lichens, and the mycelia of fungi, and perhaps their fruiting bodies. This entire patch of bare earth has been grown over with a pink fungal structure. A green tint is forming over it, which may be a different mycelia, or the algae or cyanobacteria of lichens in formation. And a little higher up, lush green thick lichens sport brown colored dishes, which are their spore bearing bodies. Even closer, they are beautiful and intricately colored works of art. This uncanny pink fungus is the substructure for Dibaeus baomyces and seems only interested in the earth, ignoring rich nutrient sources of dead wood and leaves, and getting very close to it with a powerful macro lens when it spies countless thousands of fruiting bodies emerging, each only a few millimeters tall. Returning to the canopy of the forest, we discover that even in the dead of winter, the trunks of great old hemlocks are entire ecosystems. Moss wraps around the trunks like skirts, and at the base we find sphagnum moss, only a couple centimeters tall, but filmed at the microscopic scale, each appearing like a tiny conifer or tropical pineapple tree. And even in the dead of winter, we can find the moss are producing spore-bearing bodies, ready to reproduce the moment conditions are right. And growing here and there amidst the moss are pale green flat lichens, more participants in the tree's ecosystem. It is Cladonia epodocarpa, an unusual sight around here. On another side of the ancient tree where the bark is very thick, we find white crustos lichens, so thin they appear to have been painted on, growing over the folds of bark like grass covering rolling hills. Except that, upon closer inspection, we find a far more complex ecosystem of lichens, revealed clearly when the image is transposed to false color. And once again I must ask the question, are they competing or collaborating? Moss lichens, and fungal mycelia grow upon the crusted bark of this ancient hemlock as if it were a drazzle, the world tree, and I find myself mesmerized by the implications of the sight. Nature, even as presented in these simple life forms, is astoundingly complex, so much so we can barely wrap our minds around it. And after thousands of years of such diligent study, scientists are only just now beginning to see the smallest inkling into its depths. Here we see Labaria pulmonaria, rare except where both air and water are very pure, and woodlands largely undisturbed. This magnificent and huge lichen is often mistaken for moss or even ivy, so grandiose is it. It is a curious lichen, and if dissected from the side, one will discover that its fungal structure acts as a substrate, like the earth of a meadow, to support its cyanobacteria and algae symbionts, supporting the argument that lichens farm algae and cyanobacteria. When it becomes dry, or cold, or both, Labaria pulmonaria changes its appearance considerably, becoming brown, brittle, and dry as an autumn leaf. Make no mistake though, it is not dead. Lichens have interesting survival strategies, quite different from their kindred plants, and one of which is that they can go through poikilohydri, meaning that when weather conditions become dry or cold and unfavorable, they can stop metabolizing and go dormant. Their life process is held in a death-like suspension, until once again nature's conditions are more favorable. And as much as Labaria pulmonaria might resemble moss or ivy from the top, its leaf-like structures, when viewed from below, reveal the lichen's underpinnings. White and brown diamond patterns of structure reveal the fungi that protect, nurture, and harvest the surplus food of the algae and cyanobacteria that call them home. On this day of chaotic weather, a sudden change in the light harbingers heavy snow-laden clouds rolling over, bringing almost wide-out conditions in an instant. But just as quickly as it came, the snow departs, and in the waning light of day, a single great tree in the forest break offers an invitation for one last moment of study, and it was well worth it, for that tree sported an amazing array of lichens I had not seen before, such as this delicate Romalina de la Serrata with its pale radial structures to hold its photosynthesizing symbionts, maximizing their ability to turn sunlight and dust into food. 
and that creamy white flat, crustose lichen we had spotted earlier, Hygogymnia and Curvoides, clearly outcompeting and overrunning many of its competitors, and a colorless, scab-like lichen called Panaria tavaresi. There is only one example of it on this tree, but it's outcompeting everything around it, and only a few centimeters away we find a veritable garden of pale fruticose lichens and epiphytic mosses, and while it looks like this little ecology is at peace, it is more likely that each organism is aggressively competing for space. I would say that the lichens are winning, based on the fact those white outlined discs with black centers are spore-bearing bodies, indicating they have enough surplus energy to reproduce. But the most amazing find upon this tree's epiphytic ecosystem was this extraordinarily colorful folios lichen, growing in patches here and there on the bark like great yellow bursts of sunlight, called Xanthoria parietina, and notice the round discs of its own fruiting bodies. Even they are yellow-orange, fungi, the color of the sun. Lichens are crucial for environmental health. They are the ecosystem's first step in transforming rock to soil, and for many creatures they form a winter source of food, as many are rich in carbohydrates and few are poisonous. Some animals use them for nesting material, insects may feed on them or use them for shelter, and small birds like the chickadee we saw earlier find them to be convenient places to hide seeds, caches for the cold days of winter. But there is an undeniable beauty in the form and colors of lichen, and a certain sweetness in the fact that these small living things provide us a world of dazzling shapes and colors, even in the bleak darks and striking whites of winter. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.